Now, next we will try to see identification of damping from free vibration record. Now, one thing we have realized that structures do have some sort of a damping in it and therefore, the response will decay now. Okay. Now, how much of damping is there? How do you measure it? Because once we have made one gross assumption that we are replacing it by a dashed pot. All the system do not follow the same, but we have assumed that. So, now let us try to take the response. So, some response is there. It is decaying now. Okay. So, <coughs> How do we try to find out what is the system damping coefficient here? So, now let me assume that this is the maximum amplitude at t is equal to t 1 and we say that this amplitude is x 1 and at t is equal to t 2 the amplitude is x 2. So, I can write an expression for x 1 x 1 is equal to e to the power minus zeta p t 1 and then x 0 cos p d t 1 plus x 0 dot plus zeta p x 0 by p d sin p d t 1. This is for x 1. Similarly, x 2 mind here that one of these terms will be present and the other one may not be because this maximum value either you will get as cos is equal to unity or sin is equal to unity. So, at the same time cos and sin uh, two of them cannot be present one will be there another will be 0. Okay. So, to be on the easy side let us assume that this part is there, but let me write it in the full form. So, okay. Now, let me take the ratio of x 1 by x 2. The bracketed term, if for simplicity I eliminate the second term here, what is cos p d t 1 unity? What is cos p d t 2? unity. So, what do you get here x 0 by x 0 okay. and therefore, the bracketed term will cancel out while taking the ratio right. So, this is what you will get x 1 by x 2 or in other words t 2 minus t 1 is this and what is the difference between this? tau d is after one cycle and therefore, it is okay. Now, this way handling the problem is a problem and therefore, we take the 
logarithm on both sides. What is the value of tau d? Two pi, then it's okay. Frequency is equal to P by 2 pi and time period is equal to 1 by f. So, if I write the reverse order, it is okay. So, P will cancel out and I can write 2 pi zeta by 1 minus zeta square. How do I get zeta from here? This is a nonlinear expression and therefore, we have already said that zeta has to be between 0 and 1. So, we will make one assumption for lightly damped system. We will say zeta square tends to 0. Suppose we take point 0.3 as zeta. So, zeta square will be 0 0.09 and 0 0.09, 1 minus 0 0.09 is equal to 0 0.91, root over of that will work out to be some 0.99, okay. And therefore, we can say zeta square tending to 0. So, with this assumption, we get the approximate value and from here, zeta is equal to We get the damping ratio as 1 by 2 pi log of x 1 by x 2. Come back to this diagram. How precisely can you measure this? This is decreasing, but how precisely can you measure it? This value and this value, hardly any difference. So, when you try to take a physical measurement, you would not find any difference. But as you go down, you will find that this comes down because of the exponential decay here, okay. So, the best will be do not consider on the two cycles, but consider n cycles and therefore, the best will be you write say x 1 is equal to consider x n plus 1 here. And 
now you take the ratio of x1 by xn plus 1 which will be e to the power zeta p t 1 which will be equal to and then we can say x1 by xn plus 1 n cycles will be there between 1 and n plus 1. Okay. Now, if you take the logarithm substitute the value here and what you get V p cancels out, we again make the same assumption zeta is very small so this tends to 0. So, let me say is equivalent to 2 n pi zeta or zeta is it's ok. So, this is how we try to identify the damping in the system where the damping coefficient is. small value. Any any questions you have here? Because we are interacting mode, you can ask a question, we can answer it also. No? you do not have any. So, we will proceed further, still have a lot of time. No? Undamped forced vibration. See, these are all simple mechanical vibration of single degree freedom system, what we are discussing it. I will just discuss few cases only. We have taken uh, undamped free vibration of single degree freedom system. We have taken damped free vibration of single degree. Now, let us take damped forced vibration again of single degree freedom system. Now, these are important to understand why, why we say <coughs> that the in a particular system what we should do. It is the same diagram which we have used earlier. And we had written the equation also. 
I am not driving, uh, drawing the free body diagram, we had already had drawn it, I am simply reproducing the expression. And this time I am not eliminating this f of t equal to 0, it is not a free vibration, it is a forced vibration. So, assume the forcing function f of t is given by a harmonic force whose function is given like this f 0 cos omega t. So, let us assume that now we are taking a single degree freedom system and say have a machine just a rotating machine which has got some eccentricity. So, it is giving a maximum force of f 0 and moving at a frequency omega, omega is the rpm you can say. Okay. So, if this is the expression then the differential equation which governs the motion We follow the same procedure, divide all through by m, okay. Now, f 0 by x s t x s t by n. Now, f by x is equal to k and therefore, this I can write as f 0 by x s t is equal to k. So, k by m into x s t right. Now, I substitute k by m is equal to p square. Okay. So, what happens? X double dot okay. F zero by M, I am writing like this X S T K by M substituting k by m for k by m p square. So, this is x s t p square. Is. Now, you take the Laplace transform. So, s by s square plus p square is the transform of cos p t. So, s by s square plus omega square is the transform of cos omega t. Okay. Putting x bar here, I get Now, the expression for x bar dividing it by this These two terms no problem, we have done it. Now, the third term is going to create some problem for me. So, let us first try to solve this transformed part. Hmm. 
I suppose that you have forgotten the algebra which you have done in school time, we will try to recollect that. So, this we will try to break it up and get the denominator 1 in the form of s square plus p square another s square plus omega square. So, partial fraction what we say. So, let us assume that this is equal to some sort of a quantity okay, where a, b, c, d are some constant are to be evaluated. So, take the LCM on the other side. So, this into this we have to write here. This into this cross multiplication. Okay. Both sides the denominator is same, they will can be cancelled out and therefore, just the numerator I should write s is equal to. Now, let me collect the coefficients of s to the power in the descending order. So, let s cube let me take s cube. So, we have a here and c there. Then let me take s square b is here and d is here. Then let me have s a omega square and you have c p square from here. And then without s we are having d omega square and then you have d p square. I think I have collected all the terms. Okay. So, left hand side is equal to right hand side. That means, the coefficients of equal power of s must be same. So, what is s to the power 3 here? 0. So, my first equation is a plus c equal to 0. What is s square here? Is again 0. So, second expression is b plus d is equal to 0. Then the third expression gives me a omega square plus c p square is equal to 1 from here. And the last one d omega square plus d p square gives me 0 once again. Okay. Now, from the very first equation you get that a is equal to minus c. The second equation gives you b is equal to minus d. Substitute these values here. So, a is equal to minus c means substituting the first one in this is minus c omega square plus c p square is equal to 1 or c p square minus omega square is equal to 1 and therefore, c is equal to 1 by p square minus omega square or one can say 1 by okay, 1 by this is also equal to this. Okay. So, c is equal to this, a is equal to that. What about b and d? Substitute minus d for b here. What will you get? You will get here minus d omega square plus d p square. That means, d omega square or d into p square minus omega square. So, let us write d into p square minus omega square is equal to 0. Now, as p square minus omega square is not equal to 0, there are two distinct frequencies. One is the natural frequency, another is the forcing frequency. So, they cannot be equal to 0. This difference, I mean they are not equal. That may be a special case when it, they are equal, but in general they are not equal and therefore, this is not equal to 0. And therefore, d is equal to 0. Okay. If d is equal to 0, b is also equal to 0. 
So, now we have evaluated the constants and we can write that s by s square plus p square into s square plus omega square is equal to a is equal to minus c and minus c is equal to 1 by this ok a is equal to minus c. So, let me write minus 1 by p square minus omega square into ok and either plus or minus c is equal to this. So, I have It's okay. Broken it up. Now let me go back to this response expression. which one should I write? One is negative, one is positive. It does not matter. Let me write. Now, you will see that this p square minus omega square is common. So, I take it out and then let me first write this. And then with a negative sign, I put this here. Is this ok? If any mistake is there, please point out, otherwise some disaster may take place. I suppose it is ok. Now, let me take the inverse of it to get the response. It is a very simple thing. I divide with this p square this term here. So, I write it in this fashion. Now, this is cos omega t ok. And this is cos p t. So, this is the full response. Now, we may introduce another this omega by p, this is the forcing function and uh, frequency and this is the natural frequency. So, usually the notation capital omega is used for small omega, omega by this which is the frequency ratio. Introducing this, we can write it in this fashion. Okay. Okay. 
right up to this is ok. Now, here you see in this response we are getting the initial conditions response which is for the pre vibration and then the forcing function part of it. Now, here we put an argument, the argument goes like this that every structure has got inherent damping in it and therefore, the terms associated with the initial conditions are totally dependent on natural frequency will die down with time. As we have seen for a pre vibration case where x 0 cos p t x 0 dot by p sin p t the whole thing dies down after some time t. After that what will happen here? So, the first two terms here will vanish after some time, but this term will continue because this is the forcing function term here. And in that response x of t you find that x s t by 1 minus omega square, omega square capital is the frequency ratio cos omega t minus cos p t. So, this response contains or there is a presence of natural frequency in the response of the forced pi forced frequency ok. That means, after some time you can say that x of t will be given by is this ok. Now, from here we try to now figure out what will happen, we just concentrate on this expression here and let us see that the natural frequency of the system which is p and the forcing function which is omega, they are very close to each other. If they are very close to each other then what happens? say when a motor starts you are starting from 0. Now, suppose the, the natural frequency of this table is a p and I am running a motor here which can have a operating speed of omega so many rpm, but when I start it starts from 0. So, when it starts from 0 and I take a condition where I say that the operating speed of this motor which is omega is slightly less than p, it has not crossed p, it is reaching p, then what happens? So, omega pi p which is the ratio here, this is slightly less than 1 and when you square it and deduct it from 1, you will get a small quantity less than 1, ok. Now, what is this x s t? the static displacement under that particular force f 0 because the forcing function I have assumed is f 0 cos omega t. So, if there is no frequency and I assume that f 0 is the maximum force which is static equivalent. So, under that I am getting this x static. So, this x static divided by this quantity which is less than 1 is what quantity is much more than 1 a uh, x static. So, if suppose I take the ratio of the frequency as 0 0.9, what do you get here? Zero. 0.9 if I take this is x s t by 0 0.2 say. That means, this part will be 5 times this value ok. Now, here I assume that this will become unity or whatever it is. So, I can expect this response to the tune of 5 times or 10 times the case may be of the static deflection. Now, when I have designed my structure to withstand that static load, maybe with certain factor of safety and factor of safety I do not say is overloading, 
it is the unforeseen forces. So, actually speaking factor of safety should not be taken as a load factor sort of a thing. And with that loading if I have assumed that the structure is safe, it does not crosses the elastic limit. What happens if this particular forcing function is applied to the structure, where the displacement goes 5 times and even if you consider it to be say elastic, the stress will increase by 5 times. But what happens that you are not having that much of margin, it will just cross and go to the non-linear range, it goes to the plastic limit and the structure may fail. So, that is the bad effect which we are bothered about and we say that when it is approaching the forcing function is up or the forcing frequency is approaching the natural frequency this is what happens. If it is the same then we can see here that this will tend to 0. If omega is tending to unity this will tend to 0 and once this tends to 0 this entire thing will tend to infinity and there will be a catastrophic failure. Fortunately, system is having some damping, we are considering here undamped system, but the system is having some damping. So, it will try to limit that and shift a little bit. Okay. Now, in this condition when it is approaching, uh, then what will happen? So, let us say that the difference between P and omega is some small quantity epsilon. Okay, uh, omega is approaching P, so P is equal to omega plus epsilon. So, omega square which is omega by P is equal to this omega I will write as okay. plus epsilon square by p square term will come epsilon square is a very small quantity. So, I will try to neglect that. So, it is approximately equal to this quantity okay. that I am calculating for this part here and 1 minus omega square okay. now cos of P t which is again in this expression here. So, let me put instead of P this value. And this is your cos omega t cos epsilon t minus sin omega t sin epsilon t. So, let me take this expression x of t x s t by 1 minus omega square cos omega t and substitute these values here. Okay. So, when epsilon is tending to 0, this cos epsilon t will tend to unity and the sin epsilon t will tend to epsilon t. Okay. So, as epsilon tends to 0 in the limiting condition, let me take this p up.
this cancels off and this will be this E will also cancel off P t sin omega t x s t this is what is the response. Okay. Okay, let me let me keep it here that that will be nice instead of uh, epsilon cutting let me put instead of this let me put both sign terms here I don't I don't want to remove them. So, what I am going to get is x t into p which is supposed to be constant and I take this small e this 2 is a constant this. So, what is happening here is a multiplication of two harmonic terms one is sin omega t another is sin epsilon t. Okay. Now, if you try to plot this here. this is the term you see these are the two terms here sin omega t sin epsilon t. So, epsilon is smaller than omega. So, obviously, this will have a larger time period this will have a small time period. So, that is what I am trying to draw actually your motion will go like this. Which is a product of two terms. Okay. So, this what happens. Now, example of this I will try to give you I do not know you may laugh at that many a times when you were school children if you have happened to walk down to the school and you will find that telephone poles are hollow poles okay. and some during the rainy season fine evening wind is blowing or some such thing you are coming back from the school and neck pass by that particular hollow telephone pole and you hear some noise is there some sound is sound is coming and it goes up and then in a musical tone it comes down and again it builds up and then again it comes down. At that time nobody knew what was that, but today after understanding this part we will find that it is this phenomena which is giving you that sound. Now, what happens that particular air column inside that um, pole has got a particular frequency. Now, when the wind is blowing you have the wire the telephone cable or telephone wire which is connected to the two poles 
wind is passed about that you now consider a circular cylinder in a uniform field of fluid flow. So, what happens it is a real fluid and once it is a real fluid you have a cylinder and there is a flow past this cylinder the streamline will go like this because it is a real fluid there is some boundary layer separation will take place and some sort of a eddies will be formed and these eddies are known as the von Karman vortex okay and they come in an alternate manner. So, they try to generate some sort of a frequency in the cable that frequency gets because it is connected to the pole gets transmitted to the pole there. Now, the pole is now subjected to this forcing function it has got its own natural frequency and the forcing function generated by the wind blow is coming to the telephone pole. Now, if that is p and this is omega and the difference between them is epsilon then the phenomena is something like this. So, when it builds up you hear that noise coming up when it is going down then it tapers down then again it builds up and then again it tapers down. So, this phenomena you have experienced the same thing in a diesel engine also when it is idling mostly uh, when the buses they stop at a level crossing or a red light then you will find the glass shutter which is very loose there it vibrates like this or the gear changing lever it is static and then suddenly it vibrates like this and then again it comes back to the. So, what happens that the natural frequency of that particular item and the idling frequency or the idling rpm of the engine they are very close to each other. So, this amplitude increases then it goes down and then again it builds up. So, this type of phenomena is known as the beating phenomena. Okay. Now, this is a very usual thing which we keep on experiencing and many a times we try to ponder ourselves that why it happens. Now, the answer is here why it happens it happens because the two frequencies are very close to each other and if you have some sort of an absorber there then that absorber say for example, the glass is rattling then if you are having a nice channel there made of good rubber then that will absorb that noise it is bound to be there because any continuous material is going to have a continuous frequency within contained within it some of them build up some of them are not that important. So, which of them will be excited will depend on the forcing function and once it is excited and then it becomes a very uh, difficult part to cool it down and therefore, such packing or whatever you call it channel in, in uh, your car glasses sometimes you know you will find say for example, we had a problem of um, Harshwardhan, Harshwardhan the inner bottom no sorry it was the outer bottom within the engine room used to break after every voyage it used to crack the reason was not known, but the ships captain and chief engineer they found out one very nice system they say that when we are sailing out there is no problem, but when we are coming in the ballast condition then only it cracks on the return path not while going. The reason was that when they are leaving then the double bottom is pressed up the two plates are acting as a sandwich construction in between is the liquid mass after that the fuel gets starts getting consumed, but still it does not come to a particular level. So, there is a decrease in the mass of that first of all the packing has gone second the mass starts depleting 
because of the fuel consumption. And at a particular mass level, it vibrates and the vibration is such because it is being disturbed by the machinery inside. Now, which was the machinery that he could not tell us whether it was the genset or some pump set or the main machinery or the thrust block or whatever it is. But what happened that once the mass is reduced to a particular level, then the natural frequency property of the structure changes, I mean it is continuously changing. At a particular level, it gets very close to this and what happens that the displacement goes up like that and then it cracks. So, these are certain uh, realistic thing, anyway we will continue further. I think today I have given a slightly heavier dose of mathematics <laughs> and uh, Nineteen fifty one, a young nation aspiring to find ways to fulfill a dream lays the foundation of an institution that will give aspiring technocrats the license to fly high. The first Indian Institute of Technology is born at Kharagpur. Founded on the basis of the recommendations of the NR Sarkar Committee that was set up in 1945 to consider the development of higher technical institutions in India, the institute was first established in 5 Esplanade East, Kolkata, before it moved to Kharagpur in 1951. With Sir Gyan Chandra Ghosh as the first director and Dr. B.C. Roy as one of its founding guardians, the institute established itself as the symbol of a young, dynamic and resurgent nation. As top students rub shoulders with the most celebrated of professors and scholars, visions took shape. And IIT Kharagpur continued to play the pioneering role that was envisaged for it, enabling India to become a knowledge powerhouse that it is today. At every stage of its evolution, IIT Kharagpur remained ahead of its times. It provided the best of facilities for the budding technologists helping them shape their own as well as the nation's future. Indeed, today IIT Kharagpur has blossomed into a time-tested venerable institute of learning. With the rich experience of converting individuals into brilliant professionals through 50 glorious years. As you cross the campus gate, you feel the distinct nip that is IIT Kharagpur. The spirit of objective inquiry and lateral thinking hangs heavy in the air. The modern township-like campus of IIT Kharagpur set in sylvan surroundings is self-sufficient in all respects. From modern banks to the good old post office, from vast playgrounds and well-equipped gyms to modern auditoria and open-air theatres, and from the quiet fibre-optic-linked residential quarters for the faculty to the web-enabled hostel rooms for the students. At IIT Kharagpur, lush green bowers of tranquility coexist with smart cards and ATMs. Spread over 690 hectares of sprawling cyber habitat, 120 kilometers from Kolkata, IIT Kharagpur 
is one of the largest network campuses in Asia. Just the academic complexes itself spreads over a built-up area designed to electrical communication and software technologies are excellent examples of IIT Kharagpur's ever-evolving pioneering spirit. Collaborations with a host of national and industrial majors are a testimony of its proven expertise and research repertoire. Indeed, in this golden jubilee year, as the celebration continues, Pandit Nehru would surely have been a proud man today. For him, IIT Kharagpur was always more than just an institute of technology. In his own immortal words, it is indeed a fine monument of modern India. <laughs> 